right, um, welcome everyone. I see um, people have started entering. Uh, welcome to this um, Groundwater Division talk. I hope you can all hear me clearly. Um, my name is Dr. Amy Orrit. I'm the Central Branch Chair. And uh, with us is Raleen Liver. Uh, she's uh, also on the committee in the Young Professionals uh, Portfolio. And she's going to be giving the talk today. So we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But I just wanted to invite you all. If you would please be so kind as to write your, your name and affiliate into the chat box, just as an attendance um, register. Hi, I see you saying good, good evening, everyone in the chat. Thanks for that. Welcome. Um, yeah, so I think we're going to um, start because it's six already. So if uh, everyone's fine with that, I'm going to introduce Raleen quickly, just tell you a little bit about her background. So Raleen's actually a, a full-time PhD student at the Institute for Groundwater Studies at the moment, um, doing a, a PhD focusing on deep drilling with some groundwater modeling. She um, did her master's and honors degree in geohydrology as well and has a background in geology, also from UFS. Um, she's come back to full-time studies, but um, she has been already um, wor working in, at a consultancy, so she's got some experience to draw on. Um, so she worked at an environmental aid con consultancy as a candidate environmental assessment practitioner, EPA, and uh, her work included environmental authorizations, auditing, um, and associated uh, licenses, water use, waste, air emission licenses, as well as then obviously specialist work in geohydrology because that's her field of study. Um, her professional affiliations include SACNAS, registered scientist in the field of water sources, uh, water resources sciences, and geological sciences as well. And she has an uh, EPASA candidate um, for doing EPAs. All right, so Raleen's passionate, obviously, about environmental conservation, specifically groundwater, and the protection of water resources and promoting water security. That's why she's also part of the Young Professionals and Portfolio at the Groundwater Division, and which helps to promote groundwater awareness and hopefully makes a difference. All right, so um, Raleen's going to be giving the talk today titled um, World Environmental Day and telling us a little bit about that and how that all... Um, factors into EPAs and environmental um, assessments and stuff like that. So with that, Raleen, I, I give the floor over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. As um, Dr. Amy said, I'm Raleen Liver, and today I will be presenting on World Environment Day. So it's going to be an introduction on what is environmental conservation and protection, um, going into legislation, and what we do as specialists and where we come into play. In celebration of World Environment Day. Okay, so I'm just gonna stop my um, uh, my video and just share my screen. Sorry, I'm just trying to share it quickly. Okay, can all of you see my screen? Yes, Raleen, we can see. Okay, 100. Oh, sorry, I think that's the wrong one that's sharing now. Okay, sorry. Is everyone, is it showing now, right? <laughs> I can still see the same slide. Okay, okay. And it's your title slide. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, in terms of World Environment Day, it's a world-renowned um, special day that we celebrate on 5 June annually. Um, so just an outline of what we can expect is, um, first up is what's going to be discussed is what is in World Environment Day? What is this year's theme? What does environmental importance Role. And SACNAS, just a, it's just a short outline, but other things will also be discussed. <laughs> okay, so day. World Environment Day. Day, the environment. 
It is celebrated worldwide on 5 June and was established what is this year's theme? So this year's theme is a reminder that people's actions on pollution, plastic pollution matter. Thereby, so solutions to plastic pollution in order to live sustainably with the environment. Plastic pollution is all around us and um, it's world renowned, it's all over. We have it on land plastic pollution, we have ocean plastic pollution, rivers that are all polluted, microplastic pollution, but I'll go into detail with that now. So what is plastic pollution or the problem that we struggle with here is single use plastic products. So basically that means that they are used just once and then thrown away. It ends up in landfill sites or as unregulated waste. Examples of these single use plastic products of polyethylene therapyl PET, and examples of this is water bottles, dispensing containers, biscuit trays, high density polyethylenes, HDPEs. Uh, examples of this is shampoo bottles, milk bottles, freezer bags, ice cream containers. Then we have our low density polyethylenes, LDPEs, which uh, examples are bags, trays, containers, food packaging forms. Polypropylene, uh, which is potato chip bags, microwave dishes, ice cream tubs, bottle caps, single use face masks, polystyrene, examples of that is like cutlery, plates, cups, expanded polystyrene, EPS, it's protective packaging, and hot, uh, hot drink cups. So these are all examples of single use plastic products, which, once again, as we say, um, as the name itself says, it, we use them once and we throw them away. Fossil fuels are used to produce these single-use plastics, which actually contribute to greenhouse gas emission, uh, emissions associated with climate change, thereby causing global warming, which is a world-renowned, once again, problem that we face. The same properties that make these single-use plastic products so useful, for example, if you think about their durability, their resistance, and their low degradation makes them nearly impossible for the nature to completely break down. The negative effects of, um, of our pl plastic solution, uh, plastic uh, pollutions, they alter the habitat and natural processes, thereby reducing the ecosystem's ability to adapt to climate change. An example, if you think about our coral reefs, so where we have a lot of plastic pollution, these coral reefs tend to go uh, extinct completely where we change the sea life and even the sea um, ecosystem. Directly endangers animal wildlife, such as unlawful land sites and plastic in the ocean, where plastic products are consumed by animals. An example of this is if you think about our single-use pro plastic products that are broken down into microplastics, which are then consumed by fish life. Um, and then we have sea animals that usually get entangled by plastic waste, which we have unfortunately all seen on social media and things like that. Microplastics are uh, single-use pla single plastics that are broken down in pieces that are less than five millimeters in size. So if you look at ocean, if you um, look at uh, our um, sand at oceans, they are usually contained all these small plastics. So a lot of people think it's mostly shells, but sometimes it's microplastics. So we find them everywhere now these days. An example of this is if you think about a unlawful type of pollution that we have with plastic pollution where people just dump this into the ocean. So these microplastics break down into microplastics, which are then consumed by, let's say, fish life. We then tend to eat this fish, which indirectly um, exposes us to microplastics and endangers our health as well. Negative um, effects of this plastic pollution, extraction and transport of fossil, uh, fossil feedstocks for plastics. So more than 170 fracking fluids and chemicals are actually associated with the fossil fuels extracted that we need to form these plastics, which indirectly can be inhaled in, um, and indigested by us, which has an effect on our human health. Refining and production of plastic resin and additives. In order for us to use these fossil fuels in order to refine up the plastic pr products, we actually cause um, these toxins that is emitted into the air 
They can be uh, volatile organic carbons. They include all these toxic gases which we inhale and also have an indirect um, interaction with meteoric water, which is rainwater, thereby um, suggest uh, opening it up to the environment, um, polluting the environment. Then consumer products and packaging. The problem with this is that you usually have heavy metals associated with it. An example of this is we have lead, we have all these secondary minerals and gas that are actually caused, we, which we inhale and ingest indirectly. Um, fragmenting and microplastics. So once again, this is the single-use pro plastic products that we have that are broken down into microplastics, which we consume indirectly or sometimes even directly without even noticing it. Cascading exposure and plastic degrades and then ongoing environmental exposure. Just an indication of the type of gases that are associated with, let's say we burn waste. All these toxic gases like nit nitrogen oxide and volatile organic carbons, methane and carbon dioxide, all of those gases are emitted, which have a direct impact on global warming and the ozone and as well on our human health. Plastic pollution, um, is found in South African rivers. If we know that even if you look at the Fall River, et cetera, that we have plastic that is found in all of these rivers. And the problem with this is this is single use plastic products. So now they can actually degrade and break down into smaller pieces into microplastics where they have interactions with groundwater and soil, et cetera, where we pollute other type of sources. How can we help? We can help by governments can actually promote um, innovation so that the production of plastics are designed to be reused. The use of plastic straws are replaced with recy recyclable straws, all the paper straws that we love very much. <laughs> um, ocean river and land cleanups. So these single plastic, single use plastic products, we can actually pick them up on our rivers, um, our oceans and our lands to contribute to uh, environmental conservation. You can shop sustainably. So next time you are out shopping, choose a food with no pla plastic packaging. Carry a reusable bag, buy local products and refill containers to, uh, containers to reduce your plastic waste and effect on the environment. Support future research to fill the knowledge gaps on plastic and microplastics in nature. Implement sufficient monitoring and compliance measures and understand environmental importance. So basically you can have a big help and influence in environmental conservation by recycling, weaning off disposable plastics, um, boycotting microbeads and doing more environmental friendly activities. Therefore coming back to environmental importance. What does environmental importance mean? Environmental importance is basically the environment that plays an important role in healthy living and the existence of life. We are dependent on the environment for food, air, water, and other needs. It is essential for every individual to save and protect our environment. What is environmental conservation and protection? Conservation protects the environment through the responsible use of natural resources. This is an example if you look at our renewable energies, if you think about sun, water, and when we use these sources to generate electricity instead of fossil fuel burning. Preservation uh, pr protects the environment from harmful human activities. For example, conserving the forest typically involves sustainable logging practices to minimize deforestation. How do we enforce environmental conservation and protection? This is done through environmental regulation, governance, and legislation, therefore competent authority. In South Africa, we have the Department of Forestry, Fisheries, and the Environment, which strictly um, governs all the laws with regards to NEMA, which is the National Environmental Management Act, in order to conserve and protect our environment. Under NEMA, uh, DEFI, we have, uh, it's also known as DEFI, sorry, <laughs> um, we have our provincial environmental departments. Each and every province has its own environmental department. For us as groundwater um, specialists and even water uh, uh, hydrologists, 
we usually work with the Department of Water and Sanitation, which is the regulatory um, department that works with the legislation and authorizes water use. They mainly focus on the National Water Act. Why do they usually authorize water users? Firstly, to protect water resources, to promote equitable, equitable access to water, to facilitate social and economic development, to protect aquatic and associated ecosystems and their bio, uh, biological diversity, and to meet international obligations. Environmental le legislation in South Africa. So now we're going to look at NEMA, the National Environmental Management Act. The term environment defined by NEMA is the surrounding within which humans exist and that are made up of the land, water and atmosphere of the earth. Microorganisms, plants and animal life, any part or combination of the first and second mention and the interrelation among and between them and the physical, chemical, aesthetic and cultural properties and conditions of the foregoing that influences human health and well-being. The environment does not constitute of the biodiversity alone, but also encompasses water, atmosphere, mineral and heritage aspects. Therefore, NEMA cannot be considered alone. When we look at legislation, we should take the following also into account. The Waste Act of 2008, the Biodiversity Act of 2004, Protected Areas Act of 2003, Integrated Coastal Act of 2008, Equality Act of 2004, the National Heritage Resource Act of 1999, the National Water Act of 1998, Mineral and Petroleum Resource Development Act of 2002. Now environmental legislation. How do we determine whether we need environmental authorization? An example is, let's say you have a project, how do we determine whether we need a permit or not? So we do a screening process to determine whether environmental authorization is needed. This is done through two type of processes, a basic assessment process, which is approximately six to nine months in duration, or a full environmental impact assessment, which is approximately 12 to 14 months in duration. During this process, the other permits that are associated with the area can be determined. It can either be, let's say, for example, you need a heritage permit, a plant removal permit, a waste management license. Um, does the project have water uses? Should they be authorized? Um, for example, here we have a general authorization and a full water use license application. So how is, who does this screening process in order to determine whether environmental authorization is needed? This is done by an environmental assessment practitioner, also known as an EAP, which is guided by the competent authority. What do environmental practitioners do? An EAP is an individual responsible for the planning, management, coordination, or review of environmental impact assessments, strategic environmental assessment, and environmental management programs. EAPs have to be registered with EAPASA in South Africa in order to do any environmental authorization process. A candidate EAP has to be supervised by a full EAPASA professional. EAPASA stands for Environmental Assessment Practitioners Association of South Africa. It was established in 2012 and is a registration authority which registers EAPs based on a set of core competencies under the Section 24H Registration Authority Regulations of the National Environmental Management Act. It exists to promote on a non-profit basis the advancements of the practice and quality of the environmental assessment in South Africa in the public interest. The objectives of EAPASA is quality assurance of an EAP by establishing criteria. This can be educational, professional experience, competencies, continued professional development requirements, and procedures for registration and sanction of EAPs upholding a defined code of ethical conduct and practice and acting in the best interest of the environment. Once again, not for the applicant, but for the environment. Sustainable development and public good and establishing disciplinary procedures and sanction mechanisms. Promoting continued professional developments of EAPs. 
promote the transformation of environmental authorization practice through the empowerment of black and female professionals, promote awareness of the purpose and practice of environmental assessments in South Africa. The definition of an EAP according to NEMA, it's going to be a mouthful, so keep with me. So an EAP has to be independent, has to have expertise in conducting environmental impact assessments or undertaking specialist work as required, including knowledge of the act, these regulations, or any guidelines that have relevance to the proposed activity. Ensure compliance with these regulations. Perform the work relating to the application in an objective manner, even if this results in views and findings that are not favorable to the application or applicant. Take into account, to the extent possible, the matters referred to the Regulation 18 of NEMA when preparing the application and report, plan and documentation relating to the application. Disclose to the provenance or applicant registered interested in affected party and competent authority all material information in the possession of the EAP and, where applicable, the specialist that reasonably has or may have the potential of influencing. One, any decision to be taken with respect to the application by the competent authority in terms of these regulations, or the objectivity of any report, plan or documents to be prepared by the EAP or specialist in terms of these regulations for submission to the competent authority. Unless access to that information is protected by law, in which case it must be indicated that such protected information exists and is only provided to the competent authority. Now the question is where do we as specialists, um, geological specialists, geological specialists, heritage specialists, civil engineers, where do we play a role and where, um, where do we have an influence on this? Specialists are compulsory in order to determine the impacts associated with the specific specialist field for the proposed project, which is used to aid the EAP in determining the overall impact of the proposed project on the environment, social and economical spheres, and finally guides a competent authority in determining whether the project should be authorized with specific compliance conditions through a license. Therefore, we as specialists play an important role in order to determine all the impacts associated with a specific field of study. Therefore, let's say you have a solar plant or a, a, let's say a hydrocarbon station that you want to put up. You have to determine all the impacts of that specific field with it for that proposed project. So it's site specific and provide site specific uh, recommendations and mitigation measures to ensure that the environment is conserved and protected. Now the question is, how do EAPS, the environmental assessment practitioners, determine what specialists they need for a proposed project? So we have this tool, it's called DIA screening tool, as required by the 2014 EIA regulations, that it determines the area environmental sensitivities. So an example of this, let's say you want to put up once again, a uh, let's say a petrol station. So you have to determine the different specialists that are required. This tool will basically indicate to you the different themes that you have and the sensitivities associated with it. So for example, we can see here, we have the aquatic biodiversity theme. It has a very high sensitivity. The paleontology theme has a very high sensitivity and the animal species theme has a medium sensitivity. Therefore, the specialist that we require here is an aquatic specialist or wetland delineation specialist, a heritage or paleontological specialist, and a faunal specialist. They are going to look at the specific impacts of the proposed project on that specific theme and provide that to the EAP in order to set up specific conditions for the entire project. So now we have all the different types of specialists. How do we write our reports? NEMA actually provides guidelines on what should be included in a specialist report for environmental authorization. And when we look at water use licenses, the National Water Act also provides specific guidelines of what should be included in the report. It is important to note that we as specialists should be registered with SACNAS, which is the South African Council of for Natural Scientific Professions. In order to uh, submit a specialist report, it has to be signed off by a SACNASP 
professional. Therefore, if you are a candidate SACNAS um, candidate, it should be signed off by a professional scientist in order to be valid for the Department of Environmental Affairs or by the Department of Water and Sanitation. SACNASP is a legislated regulatory body for natural science practitioners in South Africa. So basically what we do is we help set up site-specific regulatory criteria, impact assessments and recommendations to ensure that the potential impact on the environment has been fully assessed and to ensure that the environment is conserved and protected. Now looking into SACNASP, SACNASP is a Natural Scientific Proficiency Act. It mandates that SACNASP should register scientific sciences in various categories and fields of practice. The mission of SACNASP is to establish, direct, and sustain, and ensure a high level of professionalism and ethical conscience among its scientists. Objectives, to proactively advise the government, government and relevant stakeholders on the contribution and role of the natural scientific professions in South Africa. To enforce high professionalism and ethical standards for the natural scientific workforce. To promote the natural science professions and science engagement in South Africa. To promote the professional development and transformation of the natural science sector in South Africa and to foster a culture of good corporate governance. What are the benefits with registering with SACNASP? So the first one is legal compliance to the National Scientific Professions Act of 2003. Recognition as a professional, people will see you as a scientist. Public confidence in you as a scientist. Marketability, employees that require professional registration in South Africa. The code of conduct, trust for ethical values. In order to be a SACNASP scientist, you have to sign a code of conduct. Input to governance, SACNASP voicing scientists input at ministerial level, so we have a say. Networking, we have various webinars and website networking portals. Potential favorable rates for professional indemnity insurance. Career adver adver um, adver advertisements. <laughs> Employers advertise vacancies on SACNAS websites and social media. Voluntary association events. Networks with field of practice peers and gains vocational career advice. Facilitates lifelong learning that is crucial to a professional career path. That's candidate men mentor programs that they have. And Continual profession development CPDs. We have various webinars which help you um, develop as a professional through online or these online webinars as and in-person events. So you, as a specialist, a consultant, a scientist, competent authority, citizen, a person that lives on Earth, can help conserve and protect the environment, as we only have one Earth that we should take care of. Please help save our planet. Do we have any questions? <laughs> hey, Raleen, thank you very much for that. Uh, I do want to um, just inter intercept at this point that um, we do, <clears throat> we are going to apply for CPD points for this webinar. So as soon as we have that, we will um, let you guys know, and then hopefully you get a few decimal point points for attending this webinar. Um, but yeah, thank you, really. That was very interesting. I haven't done a, um, you know, an environmental assessment before, so it was very interesting to see the process and how, how that all works. Um, if there are any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat. I see Peter says um, that was great. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Um, if there are any questions, um, yeah, please, Put it in the chat, and then we'll 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 take it from there. Um, but yeah, it's nice to be celebrating World Environmental Day because it brings a lot of different people together, not just hydrogeologists, right? So a whole bunch of specialists can be working on this. Um, so in the meantime, Raleen, I have a, a question 
for you. It's, it's got two, part, two parts. So um, in your um, experience working on these sort of environmental assessment impacts, you know, it's a long duration. It's, you know, you, you say from ever from six months up to a year, you know. Um, so um, could you, could I put you on the spot and like, could you walk through the, uh, like a real life application, like an example of where you, you actually, you know, did this. And then I, I know you say, you know, you have to take the environmental as the, the, the forefront, the most important aspect, regardless of what your applicant wants. So and how do you like, work, how do you get around that when, you know, your client is playing you to do an environmental assessment and, and you're actually coming back with results that are unfavorable saying that they actually can't do that. Okay, thank you for that great question. <laughs> um, okay, firstly, uh, how the, the whole process actually works, uh, the practical type of application is, um, let's say, firstly, you have a farm, um, let's say an, an a farm with an abattoir. So firstly, you will have different type of waste streams, such as um, the blood and waste, overall nutrients, um, all those type of waste streams, firstly. So the department will first check um, if you have your you have a listing notice one and listing notice two and listing notice three according to NEMA. So you have to see specifically does your project trigger listing notice one, two, or three. Um, as an EAP, they will tell if you need authorization or not. So that will depend. Um, listing notice one and three will tell you, hey, it's a basic assessment, so it's a shorter type of project. And if it's listing notice two, it's much more strict it's um, usually a full environmental impact assessment. So that just means you have different type of um, uh, periods that you have to actually work with the department that they have to make sure that you're still on the right track. So it's much more sensitive than the basic assessment, more or less. Um, so what happens now, you are the EAP, you have this project. Now you start writing up the entire basic assessment and it's done according to a specific guideline. So you have to make sure you have all the information, you have client deeds, um, deed, title deeds, you have the client details, you have to make sure that they have an environmental policy, a health and safety policy, um, that the type of chemicals that they use um, have their MSDSs, that you have all the information. And through that, now you have to run like the screening tool that I provided, the DR screening tool, and that will tell you specifically what type of specialist you do need. Um, for example, if you look at, uh, uh, it says, okay, groundwater resources. So now we know that we need a geohydrologist because we're working with waste streams. Now you appoint a specialist. A specialist goes out into the field, determines the site-specific impacts. So basically, not just overall impacts, but for that specific site, for that drainage system, um, determining the storm water, separating clean and dirty water, all those things. They provide their feedback in, um, at the end of the conclusions with the recommendation measures. Now you as E have to take all the specialist recommendations, go through it and set up a new set of recommendations, conclusions, and the overall impact. So now you provide it to the departments. So let's say for this case, um, the applicant, you see that it has a negative impact on a wetland. Because we know um, wetlands is big, it's a big red flag. You can't be within 20 meters or sometimes 40 meters of that, uh, of that uh, wetland. All depending on the legislation. Um, so let's say we have a wetland there and we say, okay, you know what, this is going to influence the wetland. There's no way around it. This are the recommendation measures, the mitigation measures, but the impact is too great. You as E have to physically give that information to the client within that report. It goes to the competent authority and they have the last say. They determine and say, hey, okay, this project is going to be beneficial for the economic, because we need food, we um, have food scarcity. So they basically, the, the department is the one who decides on whether the project should be authorized or not. You have to give your honest opinion. You have to be independent, unbiased. So the information that is provided, you have to have a clear conscience and you're there for the environment and the public. So no matter what type of client you're dealing with, um, their reputation, you have to first and foremost um, have to abide by that code of conduct that you signed in order to be a ER pass RE or a SACNAP scientist and you have to give the true facts and um, not be, you have to be unbiased. <laughs> uh, so basically you, you can't be for the applicant, you have to be for the environment and for the public. If that happens and there is a little impact and the project is authorized, it's a win, win for all and the environment is safe. 
if it's not and the department says, hey, you guys are going to have big influence, it's not going to work, then unfortunately the client spent all that money just to know that they can't uh, develop. And that has happened quite a few times in where, um, where I've, I've been involved. But rather that then let's say you have a big influence on the um, environment and it takes a lot of money and a lot of resources to rehabilitate that area. And it's we all know that rehabilitating an area, you can never take it back to the state that it was in. You can take it to the best state possible, but you can never take it back to its original state. Yeah. Sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> No, great, great answer. And yeah, and, and specifically with groundwater, I mean, it's so it's so much it's so much easier to protect it than to try and remediate it in hindsight because to remediate groundwater is really a nightmare. Okay, cool. I see there's one. Um, oh, I, oh, Yolanda answered it already. Someone said they had technical issues. You know, how can they access the recording? Um, so afterwards, we normally have a debrief of the webinars. So we'll uh, link the full recording online in some way and, and and if you're a delegate we'll obviously send you that link as well um yeah just a reminder if you haven't put your name and, and affiliate in the chat box um please do do that and then um there's a question here from cindy hey cindy is it frowned upon to use a hydrologist engineer etc from one company um by dws etc that's Sorry, for you really. repeat that question oh uh, she's asking is it frowned upon to use a hydrologist engineer or e um from one company um by dws i i assume she's saying if you have multiple specialists and they all come from one company is that what you mean oh, I understand. like is that ethical oh okay okay so or, most you know, of the time frowned upon <laughs> no 100 percent. so it can be the same company uh usually remember that you still sign a code of conduct so each specialist it's, it's not just done under this specific company but it is sometimes frowned upon if you have the environmental company that's doing the environmental impact assessments use in-house specialists but i know in south africa most of the specialists are actually from um they they are they in-house because i mean that's how you not uh, use external specialists but if i according to legislation it all has to be according to NEMA law, as well as Department of Water and Sanitation, what they say in the National Water Act. Um, so you just have to read the, um, the legislation, make sure that you do comply. So basically what, from, from my point, of view, you have to be independent and unbiased. So if it's specialist from the company itself, sometimes you it's actually a conflict of interest. You just have to make sure that it's not. Um, so they are, ways loopholes through that if you register and you're a scientist um let's say you're a SACNA scientist you're an in-house specialist but you have signed a code of conduct as long as you still stay unbiased and independent sort of it's it's kind of fine but um from my view i think if you are the company that's doing the the environmental authorization or the water use license you should outsource your specialist Do you know if that has any sway with DWS when they're evaluating applications, you know, um, whether they from were what? external or not? Did you ever get any comments back from DWS on that? Sometimes they do actually send comments to the specialist. It all depends. But um, in, in the cases of like where I would previously worked, they didn't have a, a big problem with the fact that I was an EEP and I was also doing the, the specialist work. But um, so that they don't frown upon it completely yet. But I do think that they should be a little bit more um, strict with regards to that. Because, I mean, if you look at your NEMA legislation and your National Water Act, they clearly state independent, unbiased. Mm. So as long as you can keep that code of conduct and in implement that, that's fine. As, but you still, you have to be unbiased by all means. I mean, even if you're the specialist and you see, hey, this is bad, but you're still the EEP, you have to make sure that you write what the facts that you don't, you're not influenced by what the department says indirectly or influenced by the client, but you focus on the public health, and the environmental health, you're there to protect them and you're the voice for those interested and affected parties. There is a, a follow-up question. Um, just give me a second, I just want to go to it, um, by Peter. Uh, he says, following up on Cindy's question, is there a way that you know of that independence can be 
is being enforced. Um, in the end, the EEPs are paid by the client and would likely want more work from that client. So yeah, okay, we're going down more of that, that questioning. Do you want me to repeat that or have you got it? No, it's fine. Um, so the problem with that, there isn't some, uh, they're not really strictly looking into the independence, but I think that the department should, um, the Department of Water Sanitation and uh, Environmental Department, because I mean, I, I completely understand what you're saying uh, is that if you have, you get more money from the client if you're the EAP and you have your in-house specialist, that makes sense. Um, so it all depends on how, how you can actually implement that code of conduct, how unbiased you can truly be. But there isn't something, I, I, from what I'm, um, that I've experienced, there isn't something that says, hey, the in-house specialist from the specific company cannot be used. But I think the department should truly look into that because, I mean, if you are the EAP, you're going to write good things for the, as a specialist in, to ensure that the um, that you get more in-house specialists or you're going to say, hey, um, you need a full impact assessment, impact assessment instead of a compliance statement to get more money. So I completely understand the question that you're asking. But I think um, the department has to really revise that um, independency of specialists. Um, yeah, and, and in terms of that, you know, we say independent, um, and um, Peter's question is asking, how, is, is there any way to enforce that? Is there a way to police whether specialists and the EAPs are being independent or not? In your opinion, is there any way to police that or is it trust system? The, yeah, from my, does, it come down to expertise? does it come down to expertise in the department it, it, to be able to review it? Yes, it literally and to just be able to see through. Yeah, okay. But remember, with all the the specialist uh, reports that you are writing, and even if you're the specialist in house from that specific um, environmental, let's say you have an environmental company and you're the specialist working there, remember that you, your report is still reviewed by the department. They have their in, own in house specialist. For example, let's say I'm the geological specialist. I write the geological report for the company that I'm working for. The department still has to revise it and make sure that I'm writing things that are ethical, it makes sense, and my impacts have been done according to the guidelines that they provide. So they actually do check whether it is legitimate or not. Um, and it, let's say in the case that you said, hey, I didn't do a geophysical study um, in case of, let's say, geological impact assessments. The department's going to say, hey, you didn't do this. Why didn't you do this? And then you have to physically defend it and say, I didn't do this because of A, B, and C. So you, as a scientist, you still have to comply with the guidelines. Guidelines, and you are reviewed by specialists. They own, so there is kind of a. I mean, they can red flag it if they say, "Hey, you, you just write this. They can actually red flag it, and they will uh, reject your report. So that can also happen. Okay, so we found an easy question. Mm -hmm. I think we need to yeah, ensure that, you know, we have the correct expertise and specialists in-house in the department, you know, that are able to see through any issues, like you say. All right, so um, there's another question here from Pichimani. Um, Is it typical for you to disagree with the government, <laughs> believing that the proposed project should not be given the go-ahead to proceed with development? If so, how do you go about that? Um, sorry, can you just quickly repeat that question? You broke up a little bit. It's controversial. She's asking, is it typical for you to disagree with the government? And then if you believe that the proposed project should not be given the go-ahead to, to proceed with development. So I think she's, um, or he's referring to, um, you know, your final recommendations. And then how do you, you, how do you navigate that if your final re recommendation is perhaps not to proceed with something? Okay, so let's say if I understand the question correctly. So you are supposed to, um, you don't have to disagree with the department. It all depends on the impact. So you have to be, uh, I am keep saying this, but unbiased, you have to look at the environment specifically of what you are assessing. So let's say the department says, um, we reject this project. You can, um, there is this thing, it's called like a, a query. So you can appeal to it. And then ask the department, why did they say this? So now what it, it opens up a complete new floor. So now basically you see what their in-house specialists are saying and what you did wrong. And they so they have to defend their side as well. So you can't just say, you know what, I reject this uh, proposed project. 
they have to do it according to specific standards as well. So from both sides, it has to be according to guidelines and uh, legislation. And it is very strict um, with regards to the appeal procedures. If that answers the question. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's relevant that there's also an appeals, and I guess it works from both sides. Um, you know, if you're unhappy with the with the outcome. Um, and those are all the questions in the chat for now. Um, I had one last um, thing I wanted to to pr propose to you, Yerlene. Um, the theme for the environmental day this year is around plastics, mm -hmm. and it really is. A, and I think, you know, where we, from where we were a couple of years ago, everyone's very aware of this, you know, using re, um, uh, reusable cups and straws and, you know, we, we're all trying to do our little bit. There's a store in Bloom where you can use uh, package free stuff. So if we can do get it right in Bloemfontein, then no one really has an excuse. Um, but my mm -hmm. question is related to groundwater and microplastics. Um, do you know anything about that? And like, because I think it's a bit of an emerging contaminant in terms of people are starting to realize there are microplastics in groundwater. We don't typically test for that when we're looking at water quality. Mm -hmm. um, how does that all play out? I even stumbled upon a, an article which was um, medical in nature, but they were picking up microplastics in human beings you know, in, in the in the muscles and stuff. So like it really is getting pervasive and we're becoming slightly more aware of it. So. Just wanted to get your two cents and maybe your opinion on that while the theme is plastic. Okay, thank you for that great question as well. Just bring it back to World Environment Day um, and the theme. So the problem with microplastics is there isn't any legislation to it right now. They're still busy with doing a lot of research on it. So it's something that a lot of people don't actually understand. So um, with each and every specific field, I think it's going to be like groundbreaking news, everything is going to change from now on because, I mean, like you said, they pick it up in humans. So um, with regards to groundwater, how it actually works is uh, to make it simple. Okay, let's say you have a waste site and you have the leach uh, leachate of the, those plastics. So remember, those plastics break down into very small particles and it actually moves through your ground as you have surface water and groundwater interactions or even soil interactions. And as it percolates throughout the sand, it can actually go into those fractures um, and thereby polluting the groundwater. So indirectly, everything that we do on surface influences groundwater. And this is why legislation is so important. Um, and as it goes into this groundwater, we know the hydrogeological cycle. Um, we're going to have, it's going to move into the surface water, or we're going to extract, we're going to drink this groundwater and directly consume this uh, microplastics without even knowing it. I mean, if you really look into um, uh, irrigation with groundwater that cons that contains microplastics, it's in the agriculture soil. So it goes into the food and we eat the food. So microplastics are literally everywhere. And I think it's so important that people actually look into it. Um, even if we, if you think about like burning plastic waste, by burning it, all those microplastics go into the atmosphere and interact with rainwater. And that through that, it actually just goes back into the hydrogeological um, cycle. I actually have a great picture of that, <laughs> um, but I actually just wanted to show everyone. Um, there's this, it's a, just a, a cycle. It's known as a hydrogeo um, microplastic cycle. So you have your different type of microplastics accumulations and how they actually end up in your groundwater resources and surface water resources. So basically this indicates to you, let's say for example, you have your microplastics that accumulates on um, dolines or dolomites type of geology, we know that they are highly um, uh, permeable. So basically what happens as it rains, it moves into the groundwater. From there on, we can actually extract the groundwater directly um, inhaling and uh, consuming this microplastics. We can use it for irrigation in the field crops, thereby once again, food goes into the food, we eat the food, we have microplastics. So they like this is like a lot of um, uh, different type of systems that they show here. So you can everyone can just like look into it. And um, this is the article that's quite a nice um, article that indicates just how groundwater is actually influenced by microplastics. And it was only published in 2022. So it's something fairly new that people are actually looking into. And I'm very grateful that people are actually looking into it because like you say, we have microplastics actually in human flesh and muscles. It, it forms its actually part of us so we are actually just the entire environment has been so influenced by us that we actually make plastics like part of the environment through 
molecules, I think, like even our, our beings, everything. If you look at animals like the fishes as well, I know a lot of fishes are actually contaminated with microplastics. It's, um, it's quite scary to know that um, our entire environment has become microplastics. Um, if you, I mean, if you look at sea sand, um, a lot of people think it's, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, shells that are broken down, but sometimes it's microplastics. It's like forms our beaches now. So it's, it's quite scary. Um, yeah, but I think the research that will come into this, I mean, any, everyone can actually contribute to filling that gap in that knowledge of microplastics and just making sure that we look at our, our environment and see if we can turn this around. <laughs> I don't know how, but um, luckily we have knowledge for that. I mean, we have a lot of scientists and if you have a, the, the good heart to help the environment and you have a knowledge, please contribute. Yeah, in, in your opinion, do you think in the future when we do water quality screening, we'll have to start testing for microplastics as well? Definitely, definitely. I think it should become like a standard. And um, if you look at your sun stew for one drinking water standards from the Department of Water and San, uh, Sanitation, even your green drop standards, I think they should even look into the microplastics and say, okay, it has to be a specific limit so that you can actually, I'm not sure how they're going to treat for it, but they should be like a, a type of treatment that was something that we can do to ensure that these plastics even if it goes to like a filtering or something like that but it has to be compliant with it because i mean at the moment we are consuming microplastics in surface water and groundwater with even without even knowing it because mm. it's not regulated at the moment but they should definitely look into it mm. good thanks for that insight Rilin. i'm gonna go check that paper out too because I, I find this very interesting Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it doesn't look like there's any more um, questions in the chat. Um, so if nothing else pops up, then I, then I guess we can we can wrap it up. Um, I do want to thank you for your time and, and putting this all together. I, I learned a lot and it was very interesting. So I hope everyone learned something at least. And um, take the take home message is to obviously, you know, we all got into this um, environmental science for a reason you know because it's something we're passionate about so hopefully that trickles over to our personal lives as well where we can try and you know reduce our impact as we go any concluding remarks from your side really and um, the last thing i just want to say is thank you so much for um giving me the platform to make people aware of where we actually play a role as because a lot of times we we know we're specialists but where do we actually go if we don't go into academics where do we play a role so, and, and just an introduction of what is environmental legislation. Remember, this is just a nutshell. If you want to go into much more detail, please read up on NEMA and the National Water Act. Um, it's very important. I know it's a lot, but it's very important to understand um, to ensure that we look after the environment. And then just the last thing is the IIH comms um, that's going to be held on 18 to 22 September. It's going to be in Cape Town. So please, if you want to, please register. And uh, I have provided the website here. Uh, five category one uh, CPD points will be uh, uh, provided by SACNASP. So that helps you um, for your SACNASP. And then um, there will be field discussions and presentations. And the Congress theme this year is groundwater, a matter of scale. So please check out the website and register. It will be, it's going to be nice and it's in Cape Town. <laughs> It's going to be an amazing conference um, and the abstracts range from, you know, local groundwater governance to international um, case studies. So, you know, it's going to be very interesting and it's, it's not just about groundwater. It's really in a holistic overall sort of subject relating to water and, and, um, and a lot of other things. So I'll be there presenting. Raleen will be there presenting. So, yeah, please consider joining. It's going to be a, a nice one. All right. Um, all right, I see there are a few comments saying thank you, have a great evening. Um, uh, thank you for that. I hope you guys all have a lovely evening and with that, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Cheers, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you.